Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 21st of May and this quick look ahead at the week beginning the 24th of May with me, Michael Hewson. Before we get on to that, um, I think it's probably going to be instructive to look back at the events of the last few days because we've seen a significant um, ratcheting up in volatility um, without really, I think, getting an overall idea of where the next move higher or lower is going to come from because I think one of the things that we can take away from the events of the last few days is the fact that we've seen an awful lot of choppiness and an awful lot of volatility but we haven't seen an awful lot of what I would call direction and th there have been a number of narratives that have been driving the price action uh, this week obviously one of which is concerns about inflation they haven't gone away albeit I think markets are starting to become slightly more comfortable with the idea of slightly higher levels of inflation. Certainly um, last, certainly this week's Fed minutes um, didn't really add anything to the overall debate for all the discussions that you saw on financial TV. Ultimately, the bottom line for those Fed minutes was that they came before the disappointing payrolls numbers, they came before the disappointing retail sales numbers, and as such are very dated and one of the key takeaways from those minutes was the fact that Fed officials were looking for a sustained economic recovery out of the US economy and certainly those those two numbers from payrolls to retail sales have really I think delayed the prospect of that so I think any prospect of a taper in the short to medium term um, has been put back, which means that it's unlikely that the Fed is going to um, tighten monetary policy either by way of reducing their $100 billion asset purchase programs or raising interest rates anytime soon. Um, and I think that has given rise to a wider concern that perhaps the Fed's apparent lack of urgency over inflation could mean this, this you know could mean that they might be too late in the event prices suddenly start to turn or run away to the upside so in essence the fed can't win um you know they, they're sort of stuck between um two schools of two schools of thought for me it's not really worth thinking about to be quite honest at the moment you're always going to get these debates um in financial markets I think for me the most important um, benchmark of where the market risk is is in the US 10-year yield and at the moment that's that's fairly steady at around 1.65%. Um, hasn't gone back anywhere near close to the highs um, that we saw in March around about 1.77% and it's well off the lows at 1.45 in the wake of that disappointing payrolls number. So I think for me the debate will inflation will go on. Obviously we saw a little bit of a sell-off earlier this week on the back of um, increased regulatory um, interventions in cryptocurrencies, which prompted a massive slide in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And at one point, the Ethereum had dropped 40%. But I think if you actually look at it from a technical point of view, while we've broken out on Bitcoin from this upward channel here, what we haven't done is broken below the 200 day moving average on this chart here and that's held the uptrend um, for pretty much most of the last uh, few weeks and months and I think until such times until such times as we get a significant uh, push below that 200 day moving average or this 30,000 level which also happens to coincide with these series of lows through here then I think the bias still remains very much towards the upside. Whatever you think about the fundamentals, whatever you think about um, how credible an asset Bitcoin is, ultimately it still has to abide by the technicals. And for me, the technicals are probably the most um, important thing when it comes to analyzing any given market. You can have all the fundamentals that you like at your fingertips. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to really sort of look at all of the fundamentals in the round and say, well, that particular fundamental um, is more important than this particular fundamental item. To strip all of that away, that's why I generally tend to 
place much greater emphasis on the technicals simply on the basis that the fundamentals um, should be reflected in the price, all of them, everything. Um, and, you know, as a consequence of that, we've seen a, a little bit of a stabilization over the course of the past uh, few days or past couple of days, but we haven't as yet been able to get much above 42,000, um, 42 and a half thousand, which are the highs from the last two days here. Coincidentally, it also coincides roughly to this peak that we saw in early January. So I think there is an element of a little bit of resistance in and around 42,000. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on in terms of the overall direction for Bitcoin. Whatever your views on it, whether you're a Bitcoin skeptic, you know, or you're a Bitcoin fanboy or girl, um, I think for me the most important part of it is the fact that it is is really the fundamentals. So the, the big sell-off in big sell-off in Bitcoin prompted, I think, a little bit of liquidation in equity markets. But overall, within the context of the uptrend that we've been in over the course of the past few months, we got a very sharp spike down after a move higher on Monday. We got a sharp two-day move lower. We managed to hold above this trend line that I drew in last week um, through here. We've gone slightly below it, but what's important is we haven't taken out the 50-day moving average. So for me, all of this volatility aside, we're still within the overall trend higher. And while we remain within the overall trend higher and above 68.05, then for me, it's very much a case of buy the dip on the FTSE 100. That has to be your overall strategy. It is struggling at the moment to sustain a move above 7,000. But nonetheless, it's not coming crashing off. Um, the lack of a rebound back above these previous highs would be a concern over the course of the next few days, um, which does suggest that maybe the momentum is starting to wane. But that could just be a, simply a case of the summer doldrums. Or if you believe in the narrative, sell in May and go away, which I don't. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Ultimately, the price action is king as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the same pretty much goes for the S&P 500, um, which again, similar sort of play out here in terms of the overall trend line over the course of the past few um, weeks and months. We are still above this nice little trend line that I've drawn in here. And that for me um, keeps the bias very much towards the upsides, even if you set aside this bearish reversal here. If we quickly look at the weekly chart, what we can also see from the weekly chart is these long lower shadows on the weekly candle. And that tells me that irrespective of the selling pressure that we're getting on a week to week basis, um, the sellers or the bears don't feel confident enough to push the market down and hold it near its lows. Um, and that suggests to me that while bearish sentiment is starting to come in, it's not yet strong enough to sustain a break lower until it does um, it remains very much a case in terms of the daily chart by the dip that still remains the overriding strategy going forward it's the same on the germany 30 or the or the dax we can see that here similar sort of story we have seen intraday spikes below the 50-day moving average in this trend line that i've drawn through here but nonetheless we still remain broadly um, above the trend lines that have been in place pretty much over the course of the past two to three months. Um, just quickly have a look at the NASDAQ. Um, this, I mean, I think, that, <coughs> I think that's the one concern that I do have. But what I would say is that we've broken below the 50-day moving average. But if we look at the way the rebound of the lows has um, played out, I think there's a decent probability we could well get a retest of this 13,700 level, given the fact that we weren't able on this move lower to take out that low there. So um, looking looking at that, this does feel like it does feel like it wants to go back to this resistance level and that red line that I've drawn in there. So those, those, I think those are really the key indices and obviously Bitcoin as well and any crypto fallout could will also play a little bit of a part in the way equity markets are playing out. But I'm still of the fervent opinion at the moment 
that we remain very much in a buy the dip mentality when it comes to equity markets more broadly, which brings me, I think, neatly on to um, the upcoming week, the 24th of May. And I should also point out that there will not be a video next week. Um, I've got, um, I'm taking some time out, I'm taking a few days off, having a bit of a break over the course of the next 10 days. So there won't be a video next week. So um, all, although there will be a week ahead summary, it'll be a slightly shorter version. But nonetheless, the key items that I've got my eye out for um, this week are US first quarter GDP. That's going to be a second iteration, so it's not really going to tell us anything we don't already know. Or um, we've also got US personal spending and income for April, um, where we could well see a post-March hangover in the same way that we saw a bit of a, a, a post-March stimulus hangover in April, retail sales when they came in flat. It was very disappointing there. I would expect to see a similar slowdown in personal spending and a big drop in personal income. As I say, I wouldn't be overly concerned about um, that because what it, what that's doing is it's evening out the big, the, the, the big spike higher in personal income that we saw in March. More importantly, and I think this really sort of feeds into the inflation narrative. You know, we've heard we've heard an awful lot over the course of the past few days and weeks about um, whether or not um, the U.S. is likely to um, either taper the Federal Reserve is likely to taper its bond buying program as we head into the end of the year. I think it's inevitable that they will start tapering. Um, I think if the economy continues to improve, and yes, some of the improvements that we're seeing are uneven, and it's likely to be slower in terms of hiring trends, simply on the basis that it pays an awful lot of people to actually claim benefits than it does to actually work, and that will slow down the rebound in the labour market. I think there is a case for withdrawing some of those benefits to try and hasten the move back into the US labor force, but they're going to be ending in September anyway. So I think we're going to get that. Um, it just could be a little bit delayed. But more importantly, I think in terms of the inflation narrative, the Federal Reserve doesn't look at CPI it, or it doesn't use CPI and it doesn't use PPI in terms of its dual mandate. It uses the core PCE deflator as its inflation benchmark. Um, now that's not to say that we won't see a strong rebound in the core PCE deflator for April. We will, uh, but it won't be 4.2% and it won't be 6%, which is what the PPI numbers, it will be lower, but it will be. It, it will also show a very significant jump from what we saw in March when it came in at 1.8%. Now, the level of 1.8% that we saw in March was the highest level since February 2020, pre-pandemic. Um, with the measure slipping to a low of 0.9% back in June last year. So I think if you look at the core PCE deflator and you look where it was in June last year at 0.9%, you're going to get a significant rebound in the April core PCE deflator. Now, part of, part of that will be as a result of base effects. We've talked about them um, in previous week's videos, so you should be familiar with that concept now, but if you're not, um, I will quickly reiterate the fact that when prices dropped a year ago, um, there were always when when the when the when the economies went into lockdown, there was a significant deflationary bias to headline inflation. That is now being reversed with a significant rebound. So you will have a knee-jerk reaction. We saw that in UK retail sales um, with the April ones that came out on Friday today. The annual number for UK retail sales was 42.4%, but that needs to be put in the context of the, March, the April lockdown of last year, when retail sales activity declined quite sharply. So you have an equalisation effect, you have an averaging effect, which basically prompts a significant rebound. So um, going back to the PCE deflator, we're expecting to see a sharp rise to 2.9%. Now, obviously, if you look at that on a historical basis, that's huge. It will be the highest 
PCE deflator number since the early 1990s. But you also have to look at it in the context of what happened a year ago as well. So there needs to be some form of smoothing effect when you talk about headline inflation. And that's what central bankers are essentially banking on. Now, that's not to say an awful lot of the price rises they're currently seeing are likely to be less than transitory. Some of them will be, some of them won't be. There is upward pressure on prices. The big question is, is it as high as the headline numbers suggest it is? And I would argue that at the moment it isn't, and we won't know for several months. So looking at the way the US dollar index on the CMC dollar index is behaving, it is starting to find a little bit of a base in and around these levels here on this chart, around about 938, 935. So for the, for the purposes of this, I would probably say there's decent support in and around 938, and we're likely to continue to get push-pull in terms of what euro dollar is doing, what cable is doing, and what pretty much every other currency pair is doing at the moment. And you can see the push-pull um, being played out quite nicely over the course of the last three days. Euro dollar strongly higher on Tuesday, strongly lower on Wednesday, strongly higher on Thursday, near the highs today. Interestingly enough, we haven't as yet taken out um, the 122.50 level or these peaks that we saw back in February. So that's the next key obstacle to a move back to these peaks here. Overall, the trend on euro dollar remains upward. We've got higher lows and higher highs. And that would suggest that we are probably going to see a retest of this chart, of this of these peaks here, but we need to get a foothold above 122 and a half, and it's likely it's likely to be a very choppy move higher. It's a similar sort of story when we talk about cable, uh, and the only and the only numbers of notes that we have are next week are UK public finances for April, which are due out on the 25th. Now we've just come off. The biggest annual post-war deficit um, last year, so over 300 billion pounds, the um, the the uh, the government borrowed to support the pandemic um, recovery. And um, I think it's important to note that while that seems an awful lot of money, 12 months ago, the numbers were basically being penciled in to come in an awful lot higher. We've got an awful lot of businesses repaying their furlough money. Um, which means that I think even though we've seen an awful lot of upfront spend, that number could still come down as more companies decide that actually they don't need that furlough money and can afford to repay all their business rates relief, whatever. Um, certainly, I think the economic hit in terms of businesses um, is probably not going to be anywhere near as bad as maybe um, an awful lot of people first feared it would be. That's not to say it hasn't been, you know, there haven't been casualties, there have. Um, and, and, you know, and that's that's really disappointing, local local businesses, local pubs, local restaurants that haven't been able to stay open. And there is going to be a significant transition period as we get used to what is a new normal, if you like, as restrictions continue to slowly get eased. Whether or not we get a full-blown Easing in June is looking increasingly doubtful, but certainly I think there is going to be an element of a more normal economy in the summer than was probably going to be the case three months ago. So April public sector borrowing expected to rise. I've, I've got a number of about 20 billion, uh, 20 billion pounds, but I think the numbers, I think largely irrelevant um, when you look at it in the overall scheme of things. But certainly I think the fact that an awful lot more people are coming off furlough as businesses reopen should mean the borrowing numbers should start to come down as we head into July and then into September. But the bias here for cable still remains towards the upside. Need to see if I want to see a move through 142 and a half, and then we can start looking back at the highs that we saw all the way back here in 2018, 143.85. Um, the highs are still getting higher, the lows are still getting higher. We are still very much on track to move towards um, that 145 level going forward. Euro sterling. Euro sterling is a tough one. It's in a range at the moment. And I think, you know, we're, we're probably due for a little bit of a consolidation. 
there's still decent resistance at 87.30. I haven't changed my mind on that. For me, the bias still remains for a lower euro and a higher pound. And um, um, the recent price action really hasn't changed my mind on that at all. So um, we've also got first quarter Germany GDP um, on the 25th. That's expected to confirm a contraction of 1.7% in the first quarter. Um, and we've also got the latest German IFO survey, which is expected to show a significant improvement in business confidence. So um, those, those are the key economic announcements. As I say, I'm just really going to circle back to the US personal spending number and income number because that is likely to take probably some of the gloss of what could be a very high PCE deflator number. Both those numbers come out the same day on the 28th of May. So in terms of personal income, we're expecting to see a decline of 15%. Um, and that's significantly, um, that's a significant reversal from the 21.1% rise that we saw in the previous month. In terms of personal spending, only again expecting to see a modest uptick of 0.4% in April, given the fact that retail sales in April came in flat. There is a there is a possibility that that could come in negative, and as and will probably feed into the narrative that while um, inflation is high or looks high in the US, um, a rebound in pent up demand remains something you know a little bit less than a than the the sure thing that an awful lot of people were penciling in two or three months ago. So that is likely to keep, I think that's likely to keep markets guessing um, as we look ahead to um, June, um, because obviously this will be my last video for May and my next video will be sometime in June. So in terms of the earnings, um, let's have a quick look at um, three or four that I've got, got my eye out for this upcoming week. Before we look at that, we're going to have a quick look at Brent, Brent crude, because at the moment we've seen three successive days of gains and it looks like we're going to finish the week lower. And the overriding story for this week has been these Iran nuclear deal talks and the fact that they there appears to be some, I think, very positive mood, mood music about um, Iranian crude being allowed back on to the international market and sanctions being um, loosened in, on the part of the US. I think irrespective of your views on where crude oil is going, and we've seen enough, we've seen a number of bullish forecasts um, from 80 to 90 dollars a barrel. We're not going anywhere much higher until such times as we take out this resistance level here. So $70, $71 a barrel, that's the line in the sand for me. While we're below that, then the bias for crude oil prices remains lower, not higher on a technical basis. So, you know, if you're reading all these research notes about how crude oil is going to rebound and head towards $80, $90 a barrel, um, may I remind you about two words that could um, um, undermine that scenario and it's called demand destruction. Now, the last thing I think the global economy wants right now is crude oil prices above $80 a barrel. Um, and certainly I think OPEC wouldn't want that either because it would certainly kill demand for their product as well. It suits OPEC to slowly release oil onto the market as demand picks up and keep prices stable. So that for me suggests that we're in the range of between $60 and $70 a barrel and the longer we stay there, I think the more likely it is that inflation expectations will continue to fall. And I think that's the key thing here. Commodity prices are showing signs in the short term of topping out. If you look at some of the recent uh, uh, moves that we've seen in metals prices as well, copper has started to slip back as well. So that's good for inflation expectations. If we start to see a stabilization in commodity prices, um, that should take some of the heat out of forward inflation expectations. So in terms of earnings, I've got my eye on a couple. Obviously, retail is a big topic at the moment. Marks and Spencer's, a case in point, is reporting its full year numbers um, on 26. Now, when M&S reported its first half numbers back in November last year, it was notable that it was the first time that 
m and had posted a loss in its 94 year history. Um, it's only a minor loss, 71.6 million pounds. Um, but nonetheless, it was notable for a 15.8% slide in sales to 4.1 billion, although its food division came to the rescue due to the recent deal that it signed with Ocado. Um, so I think with respect to the full year numbers, hopefully the company won't post a loss, but the share price, um, the share price movements over the course of the past month or so, um, they've been fairly stable. So they've been stable within a range, 164 on the on the upside, and fairly decent support at around about 144. I would be surprised if the numbers were 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 bad were bad enough to send the shares back down below these lows. They're going to be a beneficiary of the reopening trade. Obviously, their food division has probably going to um, significantly contribute to revenues in the second half of the year, given the deal with Ocado. And I certainly think in terms of going forward, they maybe need to widen the number of products that they make available via Ocado to try and push the numbers up for the general merchandise um, section. Nonetheless, not really expecting any surprises from Marks and Spencer. Sticking with the retail theme, got Ted Baker. Now this is a nice little chart here, because what we've got is a series of previous peaks through 172, and we've got a trend line from the March lows. Now, you know, my myself here, I actually like Ted Baker products. You know, they make very, very good products. Unfortunately, the management of the business hasn't been particularly great. They're on a slow turnaround plan, if, you know, and if we can see how the fortunes of Ted Baker have really, yeah, I mean, that, that sort of tells you everything, that chart there. I mean, this is where Ted Baker was back in 2018, over 30 pounds a share. Yeah, and now we're all the way back down here. So they've fallen an awful long way. They've signed some fairly decent deals in Asia. Um, and I think the Chinese business could well provide a boost. We've certainly seen evidence of that in other retailers that have exposure in the Asia region, Hong Kong, Macau, um, and the greater China region as well. And despite the recent losses, the new CEO, Ted Baker, Rachel Osborne, has insisted that free cash flow will be positive this year in spite of the restructuring efforts and COVID-19 headwinds. Ted Baker don't have a big store footprint. So I think in terms of the turnaround plan, even though the shares are off the highs of May, as long as we stay above 172 and a half, you know, the up the uptrend that we've seen thus far, um, you know, it's st it still it still looks on course for a fairly resilient um, second half of the year. Um, quickly look at Aviva in terms of support levels here. It's their first quarter numbers. Been on a bit of a disposal spree in recent months, and the share price move higher suggests that investors are fairly positive about the turnaround plan, which focuses very much on the UK and Ireland businesses going forward. And I think the big question that needs to be asked there is, is all the good news priced in as it gets set to update the markets on its opening quarter of the new fiscal year. Um, quickly look at Snowflake at IPO'd. Um, end of towards the end of last year um, when snowflake reported in march its revenues came in better than expected at 190.5 million dollars losses rose to 70 cents a share or 199 million dollars largely as a consequence of higher stock compensation so i think with respect to here it's really about revenues um, annual revenues rose by 120 percent at the end of last year to $553.8 million. Um, and since those peaks that we saw in December, as part of the tech space, the share price has continued to slide back. If you look at the valuation on Snowflake, and it's hefty. It's hefty for a company 
that turns over less than a billion dollars or is expected to turn over less than a billion dollars a year. For the current quarter, the company says it expects to see revenue of $200 million, um, which would be in line with market expectations. So we've got decent resistance all the way through 240 here. If we look at that low there, and then we look at these series of highs through here, you can see there's a nice decent barrier all the way through here. And, 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 and as a consequence, I would keep, I would certainly keep an eye on that particular level for any further advance, advances um, to try and undermine the uptrend that has been in place since those December peaks. Uh, I'm going to finish up with NVIDIA. Similar sort of story here. I mean, it's been a real success story for NVIDIA. Um, this is this is new fiscal year. The last two quarters for NVIDIA have been really impressive. Um, most people know NVIDIA for graphics chips. However, it's also been moving into high spec CPUs for data centers. And that's where the real growth has been. Now, there is some talk that it's $40 billion deal for ARM Holdings is currently under review. And obviously that could well act as a drag. But even without that, the shares are only marginally down from the record highs that we saw in April. And the biggest revenue earn has still come from the gaming segment with a 41% rise in revenues, which accounts for $7.6 billion of the 53% rise in total revenues that we saw in last year's accounts. Data center revenue was the big gainer in 2021. That rose 124% to $6.7 billion. Now, in the last quarter, the company saw $5 billion in quarterly sales for the first time ever. In Q3, it saw $4 billion of quarterly sales. So in the last quarter, it increased sales by a billion dollars, by 20%. Big question is, can they maintain that sort of growth strategy? The cloud obviously is a big boon. You know, it's a big growth market. And obviously, data center chips are a key component of that. Um, so I think a key test for NVIDIA is, will it be able to sustain the type of revenue growth that we've seen in the last two quarters? Um, profits are expected to come in around $3.27 a share. Okay, so that sort of, I think, neatly summarized, brings me to the end of this week's weekly market update. Once again, thank you very much for your patience. Um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I will speak to you all, hopefully, in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks very much and hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks a lot.